well as their experiences have been denied, silenced, devalued, and discredited. As the founder of Lao Women Lead, an organization championing the holistic well-being of women of color, a full-time, four-time, excuse me, Emmy Award-winning journalist, D Magazine's best news anchor, and a two-time Best of Black Dallas Journalist winner, she's not just breaking barriers, she's setting the stage ablaze. From testifying at the state capitol to championing the Crown Act, this journalist, also known as the internet's favorite cousin, has worked tirelessly turning adversity into power. Every morning, she defies norms on our screens, on WFAA News, embodying the idea that news is about pioneering new horizons, not conforming. Tonight, we will welcome our MC, the unstoppable disruptor and inspirational thought leader, Ms. Tashara Parker. What is up, everybody? Good evening. How y'all feeling? Okay. Oh, I have the pleasure of being a part of this. I'll tell you this real quick. As MCs and hosts, a lot of times the first thing you say is, it is my honor to be on this stage. I truly mean that tonight. It is my honor to be a part of tonight's event. So please give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> on this first day of Black History Month, it is poetic that this historic organization, Rainbow Push, commences a new era while reflecting with gratitude on its rich legacy. We welcome you to the installation of Frederick Douglass Haynes III as the second president of Rainbow Push. Rainbow Push was founded by Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. Oh yes. It was founded as an outgrowth of his pioneering work for economic justice at Operation Breadbasket. Reverend Jackson, a protege of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., had built an impressive record as a social justice activist fighting the oppression of Jim and Jane Crow apartheid. People united to save humanity became people united to serve humanity and lived out its name, uniting people to serve by pushing for educational equity, economic justice, political enfranchisement, and showing up whenever injustice, racism, and oppression would rear its ugly head. Tonight, that legacy continues for such a time as this. Reverend Jackson and the board of Rainbow Push has tapped Reverend Freddie Haynes to succeed Reverend Jackson and continue this work. Now, Reverend Haynes has built a reputation for uniting Jesus and justice as a pastor, community activist, and faith leader. He has served as the pastor of Friendship West here in Dallas. Friendship West, where you at? <laughs> yeah. He has served at the church for 40 years, over 40 years, and the ministry of the church has been noted for her social justice activism under the leadership of Haynes. We are living in challenging, even chaotic times, and tonight we are witnessing the pivot of Reverend Jackson and the ascension of Reverend Haynes for such a time as this. Hey, I know you know this, but this is a historic evening. Yeah, and... And we are all so excited that we have so many history makers in the building, including Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson in the house. I am Tashara Park, as she already mentioned, a truth teller here in Dallas. So this is your welcome, okay? And as we all witness and participate in this historic event and we celebrate leadership, such a time as this is our theme tonight and always, and needless to say, the time is now.
I go even further to say time flies when you're doing this social justice work. I'd also like to say time can also stand still when it seems like true change has yet to come. It might even seem like we're going back in time when some of the laws on the book remind us of a time not too far in our rearview mirror. So the theme, such a time as now, is right on time. I want to start tonight's program the right way, and that's in prayer. But before I get there, okay, we're going to do this thing the right way. When I call your name, if I do call your name and you're on the program, make sure you make your way to stage right, because we don't want to be looking out in the audience trying to find anybody, okay? So make your way stage right, amen? Okay. Now as we move on to our prayer, please welcome to the stage the senior pastor of Concord Church and the president of the African American Pastors Coalition, our pastor Brian Carter. And after the prayer, please stand for the singing of our hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing, led by Sabrina Kessie and Ragey Little. Welcome to the stage, Pastor Brian Carter. Let us pray. God of our weary ears and God of our silent tears, thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, thou who hast thou, through thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in this past, we pray. Dear God, on this first day of black history, we come today to celebrate legends in the making. We come today celebrating what you've already done. God, you've been the God that has kept us through every scene of the past. And tonight, Lord, we come to celebrate and thank you, first of all, for our Moses, Reverend Jesse Jackson. Father God, we come tonight to celebrate him. We celebrate over 50 years of leadership, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for his prayers. Thank you, Lord, for his activism. Thank you, Lord, for him marching. Thank you, Lord, for him suffering for the cause of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for him standing strong, even sometimes when he had to stand alone. Thank you, Lord, for the attacks he had to endure to keep up the work you had called him to. Thank you, Lord, that he fought through the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s and the 2020s, and he continues fighting today. So, Father, we celebrate him tonight because he is a fighter and a preacher and an icon and a legend and a model and someone that we thank you for. Thank you that he was a voice for the voiceless. Thank you that he stood strong and he paved the way. And we honor you, Lord, for his life. Lord, bless him as only you can. But Lord, we also thank you that tonight we celebrate the passing of the baton from Moses to Joshua. That tonight we celebrate that you have raised up a Joshua for such a time as this. We thank you, God, for the prophetic preacher that you have positioned for such a time as this to proclaim your word in the name of Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes. We celebrate, God, that for such a time as this, while racism is on the rise, you've sent us a voice that can point us in the way to go. Lord, use him, Lord, to fight for true faith and against white Christian nationalism. Use him, Lord, to fight for voting rights in a state with the most oppressive laws in the entire country. Use him, Lord, to fight for the 140 people living in poverty. Use him, Lord, to fight for the 37 million people that don't have access to health care. Use him, Lord, for our brothers and sisters that have served their time on the inside, but come on the outside and are still living under the new Jim Crow. Use him, Lord, for women that have been misused and children that have been abused. Use him, Lord, for migrants on the border of this country that can't get in to get a fair chance. Use him, Lord, for those still struggling to get clean drinking water. Use him, Lord, for economic opportunities, educational opportunities. Use him, Lord, to write the history that some people want to whitewash. Use him, Lord, to fight for the oppressed and the marginalized. Lord, you have raised him up for such a time as this, and we thank 
you for the life, for the ministry, for the leadership, for the example, for the model, for the tenacity of Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes. He's an instrument in your hand. And Lord, we are here tonight not just to celebrate him, but to let him know we are with him in the fight. We will give our money. We will show up. We will vote and do whatever to help your work continue. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in the life of our brother, Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes. We celebrate in advance the vision and the work that's going to take place through the Rainbow Push Coalition. God, do what only you can do. It's in your hands, and we can't wait to see what you do. In Jesus' name, we say this prayer, and all of God's people said amen.
places our God where we met He lets our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget He shadowed me Please give it up one more time for Sabrina Kasi and Ray G. Little. Look, we are honored, okay, to have a number of outstanding public officials and leaders here with us this evening. Please receive greetings from the chair of the board of Rainbow Push, C.K. Hoffler, also the immediate past president of the National Bar Association. And after Chair Hoffler, we will hear from Dr. Run Daniels, who serves as president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century. After Daniels, we will witness a video history of Rainbow Push. Please welcome C.K. Hoffler. Good evening, everyone. So, 37 years ago, even though I tell people I'm 37 years old today, I had the pleasure of working and representing the iconic, extraordinary visionary, a man who needs no introduction and who for six generation, 60 years, has fought the fight, continues to fight the fight, and has led us and this country in civil rights, in human rights, and freeing people all around the world. And that is none other than Jesse Lewis Jackson Sr. I want us to stand and pay homage to Jesse Lewis Jackson Sr., the founder, the visionary who fought for 60 years, day in and day out, refused to be denied. And Reverend Jackson, today, as we inaugurate the incomparable Dr. Freddie Haynes. Dr. Freddie Haynes, Reverend, to stand on your shoulders. Reverend Jackson, we have to say thank you. We thank you for being there when no one else believed. We thank you for being there and telling us, I am somebody. And embodying in all of us a sense of pride and dignity when no one else did. We thank you for being there internationally and leading the fight globally and bringing to the continent of Africa the term African American, explaining to our motherland what that means, Reverend Jackson. We thank you. We thank you for freeing people who were in jail in other countries over and over when the U.S. government was not able to do what you could do. We say thank you. And Reverend Jackson, we thank you for day in and day out doing so much and forcing administrations to take note of our people and refusing to be denied. Reverend Jackson, we say thank you. And we say thank you, Reverend Jackson, for pivoting and being to date the only civil rights leader that has lived to be able to welcome his successor. And Reverend Jackson, for us, for everyone, for the world, we say thank you. And Reverend Jackson, to your family, Dr. Jacqueline Jackson, 
Reverend or Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr., who's here, and Gina, to Santita Jackson, to Jacqueline, Dr. Jacqueline Jackson, to Congressman Jonathan Jackson, we say thank you for their sacrifice so that we could have a day such as today, Reverend Jackson, where we could welcome someone who is standing on your shoulders because your vision and your legacy will always be preserved and embodied in one Dr. Freddie Haynes. And, and I say that because we're here amongst civil rights royalty. We really are. You know, Reverend Jackson, we're here with Reverend Al Sharpton. Oh, yes. We're here with my fellow Hoya, Mark Morial. Oh yes. And so many others are here to welcome Dr. Freddie Haynes, but I have to say this, Reverend Jackson. You had a vision, you have a legacy. You've appointed and anointed someone to take in and stand on your shoulders. And we thank you for pivoting, but for always being there present so that the struggle continues in Portuguese, a luta continua, a luta continua, vitória e certa. The struggle continues, but victory is certain. And so ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Freddie Haynes, to you, to your wonderful wife, to your daughter, to your family, to this entire, I say congregation, because I feel that I'm in church, you see. We want to welcome you on behalf of Rainbow Push Coalition. We want to welcome you on behalf of Citizenship Education Fund and our chairperson, John Graves. We want to welcome you on behalf of the entire Rainbow family. In fact, we want to welcome you on behalf of the world because you are standing on broad shoulders. You are going to do what we know you're going to do throughout the world, and we thank you too, Dr. Haynes, for agreeing to do this because we have high expectations, but I want you to know that we are going to be there with you. This is a joint effort, and to your family here, oh, it is so fortuitous that we are here in Dallas, Texas, with your family, your church family, your political family, your dynamic family, I guess your alpha family, alpha family. We got some cues in the house too, but the alpha family. We got some Kappas in the house too, but we got an alpha family. We say to you that Dr. Haynes, you will never, ever, ever be alone in this journey. So again, on behalf of Rainbow Push and the people that stand on the magnificent shoulders of Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, we want to welcome you and we thank you. I'm so fired up, I don't know what to do to be here on such a historic occasion. My name is Dr. Ron Daniels. I'm president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century and convener of the National African American Reparations Commission. What an auspicious occasion. The Reverend Frederick Douglass Haynes has been called by the Creator, the Ancestors, and Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson for such a time as this. And what time is it? It ain't too rough for us, I mean, we can handle it, but what time is it? It's a time in the rise of white nationalism, fascism, in the person of that orange guy, the orange man, a.k.a. Agent Orange, <laughs> and his MAGA mad movement, which constitutes a danger to the Constitution, but it also constitutes a danger to democracy in this country. And so he is called, this prophetic voice, not just a great preacher. We've got a lot of great preachers. He has built an institution, an African-centered, liberate, liberating institution here in the city. One of the most powerful churches in the United States of America and the world. So he's ready for the revolution, as Stokely Carmichael, a.k.a. Kwame Ture, used to say. But also we know that we have issues in black America because they're attacking the very idea that we can talk about our history. 
you know, talking about us being too woke. Well, they need to be woke too. Everybody needs to be woke, right? Affirmative action is under attack. Voting rights is under attack. It's almost like we have the second post-reconstruction up in here. But it ain't too much for us to handle because we have the Reverend Dr. Freddie Haynes for such a time as this. We got issues up inside of our community. We know we are not a perfect people. We have been traumatized by generations of enslavement and all of the legacies, therefore. And sometimes it manifests itself on us turning on each other. And so we have violence in our community. But we're going to deal with that violence in our community because we have a great healer in the person of the Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes. Right? Gentrification is displacing black people and black culture. Y'all all know it. All across this country that's happening. But that's all right because we have a renaissance man. A renaissance man in the rainbow rising up to take on these great challenges. And so we celebrate this moment. We welcome him not to the struggle because he's already been in the struggle. He was appointed and anointed by Reverend Jesse Jackson because he's been watching him all the time as we have been watching him grow and develop for a moment like this. He's resilient. He's tough. He's strong. He always has already told the President of the United States that there can be no restoration of the soul of America without reparations up in here. That's what Reverend Frederick Douglass Haynes has said. And you know it's providential. Lord have mercy, they, his parents named him the Reverend. They named him after Frederick Douglass. And what did Frederick Douglass say? If there is no struggle, there is no progress. And those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men and women who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without the light, the thunder and the lightning. They want the ocean without the awesome roar of its many waters. The struggle, Douglas said, may be a moral struggle or it may be a physical struggle. And it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand it never has and it never will. Find out just how much a people will submit to quietly. And you have found out the exact amount of the injustices and wrongs that will be heaped upon them and imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance, endurance of those who they oppress. We ain't worried about that because we're not going to be oppressed up in here. Because Reverend Frederick Douglass Haynes has anointed for just the time has hit this. And we know that what he will do is keep hope alive. Reverend Frederick Douglass Haynes will keep hope alive. Who is Jesse Jackson? Have you ever witnessed the resolve of a real champion? Have you ever walked with Reverend Jesse Jackson on the road to battle? Have you ever seen him persist when others resist? Hold your head high. Stick your chest out. You can make it. Have you ever seen him take the road less traveled? We are humane people. We fight for justice and fairness. Always a helping hand on the road to freedom. Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. and the Rainbow Push Coalition, still the long-distance runner, and still no more impossible dreams. Can I be admitted? No, sir, we, you cannot be admitted. Why? I am not going to serve you because of my race. I'm not going to serve you. I didn't decide to become branded as a civil rights sit-inner. I couldn't use the public library, so I sat in and it became... I was arrested, to, to sacrifice, and some risk involved in that. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. appoints Reverend Jackson in 1966 to head Chicago's Operation Breadbasket, Southern Christian Leadership Council's self-help economic uplift program. 
In August of 1967, Dr. King appoints Reverend Jackson National Director of Operation Breadbasket, which negotiates hundreds of jobs and millions of dollars for African American neighborhoods across the country. America's future, the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. The manager of Walter Mondale's campaign called him out and he said, uh, you know, tomorrow night's speech is very important to the Democratic Party. Can you kind of give me an idea of the direction that you're going to go? And he said, tomorrow night you will either be a chimp, a chump, or a champ, but you won't know until tomorrow night. I remember 1988. I just remember Ron Jesse Moon. We were just cheering and chanting and the impact of him, of seeing him at the DNC. He was telling people, regardless of color, if they're really being poor, ignored by their government, or have been marginalized by a political and economic system that really doesn't care about them, that you should be supporting him. We had what money could never buy in a campaign. We had passion. Jesse Jackson, you see me on TV, but you don't know the me that makes me me. You talked about not being able to be able to do the stuff folk take for granted. And the young guys who didn't want to talk, didn't want to hear them, they started crying. Because they were able to convince them, I do really understand. You think you got a bad record? Who my, what my name is, where it came from, what my background is. You see? I was born a teenage mother, who was born a teenage mother. I understand. I know abandonment and people being mean to you and saying you're nothing and nobody and can never be anything. I understand. I understand when nobody knows your name. I understand when you have no name. Understand. And he's talking about it to people who are sitting there thinking, that's me, that's me, that's me. And he's running for president. And he's on the stage. And the message he sent that was more than just subliminal, it was this reality that said, you know what? I can do it. Because he understands what I'm saying. It's hard to imagine how we could have come as far as we have without the creative power, the keen intellect the loving heart, and the relentless passion of Jesse Lewis Jackson. And God isn't done with him yet. All right, we're going to try to stay on time. Everybody all right out there? Okay. Up next, we will have the introduction of our keynote speaker by attorney Jennifer Jones Austin. Jones Austin, who recently gave le leadership to the history-making Racial Justice Commission in New York City, is the CEO of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. Our guest keynote speaker, who don't need nobody's introduction, but we're going to give him one, the iconic Reverend L. Sharpton. Look, Rep Al Sharpton uh, has a flight to catch, so he has been moved up in the program. Haynes was determined that Reverend Sharpton speak to us this evening, and we, of course, don't want to miss him. After Reverend Sharpton brings the house down, as we know he will, <clears throat> more to come. Following Sharpton, we will have greetings from Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, who is a member of Friendship West and the Congresswoman of the 30th District. After Miss Crockett, Vincent Hall will sing right after uh, she's up here. So please help me welcome Jennifer Jones Austin. Good evening. Like all of you, 
I feel blessed, immensely blessed, to be here to witness the installation of Reverend Dr. Frederick Haynes III as president of the Rainbow Coalition. Dr. Haynes, my dear friend, has gifted me the tremendous honor of presenting, not introducing, but presenting to you our keynote speaker, a person who needs no introduction because he's known in just about every household in this land and beyond. Having joined the civil rights movement as a youth better than 55 years ago, under the watchful eye of Reverend Jesse Jackson and my father, Dr. William Augustus Jones, Jr., he's more than a household name in my family. He's a member of my family. He's my big brother. And to the world, he is the most forthright defender and advocate of civil rights with a laser focus on black Americans whether at the side of a mother, brother, or child whose loved one has been lost to police brutality, or in the courtroom seeking justice for a human being slain by a racist vigilante, or leading a march of thousands for voting rights, whether traveling to the border to see about our Haitian brothers and sisters, or leading protests and demonstrations against government officials seeking to ban the teaching of black history and critical race theory, and private citizens seeking to roll back DEI. He is speaking up and speaking out. At the house he built, the National Action Network House of Justice, where the highest ranking elected officials from the White House and Congress to state capitals and city halls come to hear from him and the community. On his weekend television program, Politics Nation, which is the most watched cable news program by black Americans. And on his daily three-hour national radio broadcast, Keeping It Real, where he hears from, listens to, and dialogues with callers across this nation about the matters that concern us all, or should concern us all, he is speaking up and speaking out. He is a voice for the voiceless as my daddy and his mentor would say, a trumpet where the flute shall not suffice. Or as the 2022 documentary capturing his life's work makes clear, for every good and necessary reason, he is a loud mouth. I present to you the Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny, Dr. Attorney Jennifer Jones Austin. Give her another hand. First, let me say how honored I am to be here tonight uh, with my brother and friend down through the years, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes, for all that he has meant to all of us as he officially takes this position, and certainly to his dear wife, who's been his partner. Now, do y'all give Sister Haynes, stand up, give her a hand. And my niece, stand up, his daughter. She, Jennifer Jones Austin introducing me tonight was appropriate because she, as Freddie, has been on the board of National Action Network for many years. And uh, it's appropriate she introduced me because she's going to help pay for that plane that's going to bring me back. <laughs> she don't know it, but she is. Unlike many in the civil rights history of our tradition, I did not come out the South. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in the Church of God in Christ. 
And when I was 12 years old, I had started watching the news a lot. I didn't go out and play with a lot of other kids because I was a boy preacher and any of the kids that didn't want to play with me because they didn't want to do mischievous things and their mother and father would hear me preach on Sunday. So I would stay inside and watch the news a lot and I became enticed with Adam Clayton Powell and I wanted to know what that was all about. That was my kind of preacher. And my mother, being a staunch Kojic member, started getting concerned that I was getting in the world. And she went to my pastor at that time, Bishop F.D. Washington, and said that he's getting too involved in worldly things. I wasn't but 12, wasn't much worldly stuff I could do. And at that time in Brooklyn, some of the giants in ministries lived in the same two blocks on President Street. Dr. Sandy Ray, Dr. Gardner Taylor lived on the corner. Bishop Washington lived across the street. T.J. Boyd lived down the block. And across the street, Dr. Bishop Washington brought me and my mother to a man named Dr. William Jones who then led Operation Breadbasket, New York's chapter. And uh, Dr. Jones said, I know what to do with him. He had this deep baritone voice. He said, we'll put him over our youth department for our chapter. And not long after that, he had my mother bring me and introduce me to Reverend Jesse Jackson. And at that time, Reverend Jackson had a big afro and was wearing vest and dashikis wore a big medallion. I said, well, I can be this kind of preacher. I like this. <laughs> and I modeled a lot after him. I didn't want a pastor like Jones and Bishop Washington. I wanted to be like Jesse. And he has been a teacher and a mentor to me personally, as well as to this nation. If there wasn't a Jesse Jackson, a lot of what we achieved as a people and as a nation would not have happened. And he's meant that throughout my life. Uh, Jesse Jackson was there. When I was baptized Baptist, he was there. When I got stabbed, he came and was the first people I saw in the hospital. Uh, he walked me to my mother's casket when she died. I spoke at his mother's funeral. So when he called me, yeah, I remember 30 years ago in 1994, we were all in Dakar, Senegal for Leon Sullivan's conference. And Freddie, we went to dinner one night. Reverend Jackson took us to dinner, Jesse Jr., me, and Reverend James Meeks. And he told us, Amos Brown at the dinner table, he said, y'all are going to be my disciples. And Junior said, I was the only one that believed it. I've been trying to act like that ever since. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. You know you said it. <laughs> but I want you to know when uh, Michael Eric Dyson called me and said, I can't make Freddie's thing. Will you go? I said, yeah, sure I'll go. I said, Freddie's been a soldier and deserves where all of us should show we with him. And the next thing I got is a call with Reverend Jackson. And sometime in the evening, he talks a little with the Parkinson's. And people say to me, Jesse Jr. says to me all the time, how do you understand dad in the night hours? I said, well, if you grew up close as I was to James Brown, you can understand what anybody's saying. <laughs> But Reverend Jackson said, you're going to be in Dallas. I said, yeah, I told He said, no, no, I didn't ask you. I told you you're going to be in Dallas because there's nothing black folks have done in this country that Frederick Douglass Haynes was not there with us. So Freddie being inaugurated tonight is not an accident. 
It is providence. Movements are built on continuity from generation to generation. If you read the Bible, it is all in continuity. Every prophet is followed by another prophet. And the prophet that comes, if you can tell they're in the prophetic tradition, Amos Brown, is they acknowledge the prophets before them. They say, I come in the name of Abraham, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we get confused with prophets and fortune tellers. Some folk are not prophets, they just fortune tellers. Siobhan, I see Siobhan here of National Council. They, they, they get up and get on TV, you know, radio, and tell you what you already know. Send me a hundred dollars, I'll give you your husband's name. <laughs> Prophets come in the lineage of speaking the truth even if it is uncomfortable. Even when Jesus came, first thing we heard about Jesus, Sister Haynes, first chapter St. Matthews is they brought his lineage back. To David and David 2,000 years back to Moses so if Jesus had to be introduced then how do we have folk we looking at that we don't know where they come from where they grounded in and who put them where they are he is connected with lineage prophetic lineage he's been that and tonight is just to make formal and a position that he will now take in these times. And that's why all of us embrace that. We are in some very wicked times. When you talk about such a time as this, look at the time we're in. Everything that was gained in the 60s is now under threat. They talk about affirmative action and women's rights and diversity, equity, and inclusion, like somebody woke up one morning and gave us that. They talk about voting rights like somebody gave us that. We fought for everything we got. <laughs> Civil Rights Act 64 was a result of struggles all the way from the early 50s. Two, some of us go to two or three rallies and act like that's the struggle. <laughs> From the 54 Board of Education, Brown versus Board of Education, 55, Emmett Till. Then Rosa Parks sat down on the bus. It was laws against us. One of the reasons we demand DEA be saved, salvaged, and protected is we fought to change the laws. Why do we need DEA? Because there were laws against us holding certain positions. Laws against us going to certain schools. When Rosa Parks sat in the front of that bus, she didn't break custom. They didn't get on the bus and teach her manners. They arrested her because she broke the law. And what they're doing right now in these times, is bringing back laws to block us from the advancements that we got. They're making laws against diversity. They made a ruling in the Supreme Court against affirmative action. They're chipping away little by little everything that our fathers and mothers gained for us. And we're sitting around here with the illusion of inclusion. It's time to get to fighting again, and we need a fighter like Freddie Haynes. We got mad three years ago with George Floyd, and then calmed down, and stopped doing what we could. And that's where Trump came from. In our dividing, they come through the middle. 
They play who going to be on TV the most, who going to be on radio the most, who got the biggest church. And when they finish, they've stripped all of us of our legal rights. Sitting up here with big titles. With no functions. I'm the senior vice president of irrelevance. I talk all the time about it. I debated a guy one night, a self-described conservative black. And he said, Reverend Al, I don't agree with all of what y'all be doing. All that marching and agitating and picketing. I didn't make it marching. I never marched, never picketed. I made it because of my background. Look at my resume. I went to the right schools. I was a member of the right fraternities. I had the right context. Read my resume. That's how I made it. I took his resume, I looked at it, I said, you're right. You went to impressive schools and you're in the right fraternities and you're in the right social circles. And I'll even concede you're right that civil rights did not write your resume. But civil rights made somebody read your resume. Don't you ever forget that some unleaded, uneducated grandmas laid down in the streets of Birmingham and opened up the doors of them university you went to. You were sponsored by people that paid a price that you wouldn't pay. And don't you ever forget how you got where you got. They're taking away voting rights, putting up impediments to our voting rights right here in Texas. Government vote ID, sending migrants to the cities with black mayors. And people shaking their head talking about what we going to do. We going to do what we always did. We going to stand up and fight back. Nobody donated anything to us. We fought for everything we got, and we need to get back to fighting right now. And that's why I come to celebrate Freddie. Because we need fighters in the pulpit. We got too many political preaching punks in the pulpit. and scraping the governors, taking photos with people. Trump talking about what he did for blacks. Pardon two or three rappers who were accused of only hurting some other blacks. And they may have been treated wrong, but what about health care? What about education? What about corporate accountability? What about contracts and economic empowerment? Donald Trump, you know, when I was growing up, my daddy left when I was 10. So we had to move back to, the, to Brownsville, Brooklyn. And I'd walk to the subway with my mother every morning. She used to uh, do domestic work to supplant the welfare check that we had to live on. Daddy didn't leave us, give us nothing. He had a successful business, but he left. One of the reasons that uh, Reverend Jackson used to get on me said, you don't come from only bad background. I had to find out who it was. That's why I am somebody meant something to me personally when I heard him say that. Because when you don't have a daddy at home to tell you somebody, you need somebody else to get that to you. And I used to walk to the subway with my mother, and inevitably some of the Young guys on the block my age would get in a little trouble. They would always say, hey, Rev, I need you to go with me this week. I, got, I caught a case. And I know that meant they want me to go tell the judge something. That was all the way right. But it, 
But I never walked down that block, Freddie, and had a brother say to me, I caught four cases. You got a guy that y'all talking about going to be president again that got four cases. Ninety-one felonies and two civil cases. And they talking about he can be president. So what do we tell our children now? How do we tell our kids to live right and stay out of trouble when they exalt in a criminal thug to be the president of the United States? Where's the standards at? Because they'd rather have no standards if they can keep us in our place. White supremacy gives immunity to any of them when the best of us, whether it's Claudine Gay at Harvard, the best of us, they strip down and we sit around running around with rumors on Instagram and on TikTok against each other while they exalt somebody like Donald Trump. We've lost where we are. We need to deal with such a time as this. <laughs> Esther was told by Mordecai. She said, I'll get in trouble if I go to the king. It's against the rules. It's against the protocol. And that's when Mordecai sent word back, maybe you are there. Maybe you've come for such a time as this. All you preachers, all you leaders, elected officials, maybe you are in position for such a time as this. Don't use black history to talk about what happened. Use black history to make some black history. Don't talk about what we did if you're not going to use that for what we're going to do now. So our challenge is to take up where others were. Do you realize that Dr. King, James Farmer, Roy Wilkins, all of them, you know, it, 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 it kills me. I was telling a reporter today. In the 60s, we had Martin Luther King, we had Roy Wilkins, NACP, Whitney Young, Urban Lee, John Lewis, SNCC. We had all of them, Adam Clayton Powell in the Congress, Thurgood Marshall on the court, Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi, Malcolm X in Harlem, all at the same time. Now we get to 2024. With all of this technology, all of this media, and we act like came but one Negro talk at a time? They changed this country on rotary phones and a telegraph machine. Here you are with all kind of technology. TikTok, Instagram, Google. Got two cell phones in your pocket. Laptop in your uh, briefcase. And can't get four Negroes together to do nothing. We got more to work with and doing less with it. And that's why they're stripping from us because we forgot who we are. We forgot why we are here and what we ought to be about. And that's why we need a Freddy. That's why we need people that are fighting. We need people that are say what is uncomfortable. Prophets don't come to comfort those in power. It's to challenge those in power. And then we need to restore the dignity and pride of our community. 
They use the culture to shape your inner, ment- inner thoughts and your mentality. Amos, you know, James Brown was like a father to me. I tell uh, uh, my staff all the time that James Brown is how I got my hairstyle. Jesse, how I got my head style. And James Brown, the last conversation we had, he called me about two weeks before he died. I didn't know he was that sick. And he said, Reverend, he said, uh, I'm confused. I said, what's wrong, Mr. Brown? He said, I was riding around. He had a, uh, a state out in, the, in, uh, in Beach Island, South Carolina, right across from Augusta, Georgia. He said, I was riding around by myself and I turned the radio on. He said, what happened to y'all? I said, what do you mean? He said, when you was growing up, I was singing, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Breather was singing respect. Marvin Gaye looked at the Vietnam War and wrote, what's going on? He said, now I ride around, all I hear is y'all singing and rapping about you niggas, hoes, and bees. He said, don't you know if you teach kids that all they are is a nigga and a hoe, that's all they going to be? The culture breaks down our children's self-image. Oh, if you want to go to the Bible, that's what happened when they brought the three boys before Pharaoh. What did he do? He had them compose the music. That when the music played, you bow down to his God. But three activists, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, said, I hear the music, but I can't bow. Because I got another music. I believe in the God that brought us across the Red Sea. I hear the music, but I can't bow. Because I hear the God that brought us across the Jordan. We're playing music where they permit you to degrade yourself and put a melody to it and you too busy clapping your hands and not realizing they're tearing down your self-esteem. I remember Siobhan when some of us had come out against using the N-word and all of us had used it, but we said we got to stop this public stuff. And Jesse Jr., some of the rappers, friends of mine, grew up with him, called me to a meeting. Al, you got to stop coming down on us about the N-word. We got free speech. I say, you do? Say, yeah. I said, well, then how come if you went in the studio and cut a record with a derogatory term against anybody but us, they won't let you put it out? If you call Italians a derogatory term, hate speech. You call Jews by a derogatory term, hate speech. You call Irish a derogatory term, hate speech. So let me get this right. Italians hate speech. Jews hate speech. Gays hate speech. Call blacks niggas free speech. You can't be that stupid. They permit us to degrade ourselves. And then when our children act like what we allow them to sing, we wonder where they got that from. So, Freddie, we got to go to the barricades now. And we got to turn this around. We, they've declared war. The reason why many don't think we're at war is because they're not fighting. But we never had the majority of folk fight. It's always been those that paid the price for the rest. Everybody wasn't in the marches that were in the 60s. We talk about the 60s like everybody was marching. Most black folk did not march. Never spent a night in jail. We never had a million man march till 95. One a million people in 63 would I have a dream. But everybody talks about that. People, I got off the plane in Dallas today. Two Negroes come over. Oh, Red Mal, good to see you. I voted for you for president. No, you didn't. If you did, we'd be having this session at the White House somewhere. But it's 
it's going to take those of us that are committed, that will pay the price for the rest. And then lastly, what Freddie brings is what was the core of our movement, and that is a spiritual side. Because if you believe all the power is in the hands of those that sit in high government positions, you will bow to that power. But if you know there's another power, if you answer to another judge, if you bow to somebody that got all power, then it don't matter to you who's in the White House or the State House. Because you can stand up and proclaim, thus saith the Lord. Every morning I get up and the sun rise, I know that Congress don't have the last answer. We need some prophetic voices that will speak up and know that God will hold you up if you stand up. There is a God that still sits high and he looks down low and he promised if we would bet speak out he'll give us the words to say and he'd hold us on every leaning side that's why dr king was effective spiritual leaders that understood they only had the answer to god and i come to freddie haynes inauguration to tell you we got to get back to a god-filled spiritual movement where we don't bow to the wicked in high places a spiritual movement that know he'll make a way out of no way. A spiritual movement that'll say he'll make a way out of no way. Even if we don't have the budget, God will provide all of what we need. I close by going back to my mother. Mother raised us, my sister and I, on welfare. But she never left Pentecostal church. And Freddie heard me tell this all the time. I used to get a little shame because mama had a funny way of shouting. Mama would get up out of seat and kind of lean to the side and start jumping up and down. And nobody shouted like my mama. And I remember when I went to Brooklyn College, I was the first one in my family to enter college. And I tried to act all, you know, like I was a bourgeois Negro. And Junior, some of my friends knew I was a preacher, said, Al, we want to go to church with you. And I kept stalling because I know they didn't understand my kind of church. And I kept you know, half of them was white. I kept making excuses. Finally, they got together and pinned me down. We going to church with you Sunday. So I went to the pay phone. Wasn't no cell phones then. And called home. I said, Mama? She said, yeah. I said, uh, some of my friends want to come to church Sunday. So oh, that's nice. I said, yeah. And I, I, I just... I just... Um, would like you to do me a favor. She said, what's that? I said, I'd like you to be cool this Sunday. She said, what you mean, boy? I said, well, you know how you kind of get into the music and get the jumping up. She said, oh, boy, going about your business. She hung up the phone. Sunday morning came. I came with six of my friends. We sat down. I didn't go up in the pulpit. I sat down in the audience with them. We about the fourth row. I looked across the aisle. Mama was sitting there with her best Sunday go to meeting hat. Had a little scarf across her knees, sitting there looking all proper. But the choir got up and started singing one of them old songs. And the more they sang, I saw Mama start rocking in her seat. And before I knew it, Mama jumped up out of her seat, leaned to the side, and started jumping up and down. And all my friends start pointing and laughing for two, three weeks. They would tease me all over the Brooklyn College campus about my mama and imitate my mama. And I didn't fully understand it then, even though I was a boy preacher. But many years later, I was leading a march in a place called Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. 
where they didn't let blacks go in that neighborhood and a young black boy named Yusuf Hawkins wandered in that neighborhood and they killed that boy. And I started leading marches out there and they'd come every week and throw watermelons at us and call us the N-words and wave bananas at us. And one morning, January 21st, 1991, one of them ran out the crowd and stabbed me in the chest. They grabbed me and threw me on in a car and drove me to Coney Island Hospital and threw me on a gurney and wheeled me in and blood everywhere. I didn't know how serious it was. I had no way of knowing what he had maybe had, had hit with the knife. And I remember they rolled me into the uh, room, the surgery room, said we're going to have to cut in. And as I was laying there, they knocked me out. And when I woke up the next morning, I had intravenous in my arms and I had an oxygen mask on my face. And I didn't know. I laid there wondering how bad it could have been. I felt like something was so inside, but I didn't know. Finally, about 8 o'clock that morning, the doctor came in with the nurse. And I said, doctor, tell me, tell me the truth. How bad is it? Did he hit an organ? Did he get near my heart? I mean, am I going to have some permanent damage? Tell me the truth. And the doctor said, well, Reverend, last night when we brought you in, it was kind of foams all over you. We couldn't see a lot. He said, but it's a funny thing. This morning we took an x-ray. And everything seemed to clear. And said, you might have a little discomfort, but... I can guarantee you everything's going to be all right. And while he was talking, I started sliding to the side of the bed. And he kind of noticed me sliding over. He said to the nurse, make him lay down. He got that intravenous in his arm. He got that oxygen. He'll tear up our machines if he gets up now. It's premature for him to leave. And he's making him lay down. And by that time, I got one leg off the side of the bed. And he said, no, 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 make him lay down. If he got to go to the bathroom, give him a bed party. Lay, make him lay down. By the time the nurse came to push me down, I got the other leg out. And I slipped off the side of the bed and I leaned to the side and started jumping up and down. I know now. I know now. I know now why mama was shouting. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I'm his own. He been fooled. When I was hungry, he been water. When I was thirsty, God will, God will, God will make a way for his children. God bless you, Freddie Hayes. Y'all calm down. Y'all know I got played, right? I gotta go after Reverend L. Hey, Sora. <laughs> I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. Um, when I thought about what was taking place today, I thought about the fact that we are living in a time of transition, which will lead to a transformation of some sort. Now, what that transformation looks like, well, I don't quite know just yet. But one thing that I can tell you is that the parallels between my pastor and myself and our journeys are kind of wild when I think about it. Most of you know that my predecessor, Eddie Bernice Johnson, recently passed away. But most of you don't realize that in 1993, Eddie Bernice Johnson swore into Congress as a freshman. And she swore in with another man by the name of Bobby Rush out of Chicago. Now, the interesting part of this is that Bobby Rush and Eddie Bernice were actually cousins. They didn't know this. 
And interestingly enough, they both ended up retiring at the same time. They thought that it was time for them to transition. And I ended up swearing in just this last year with a man by the name of Jonathan Jackson, who became the successor of Bobby Rush. The reason I bring up Jonathan is because Jonathan Jackson is the baby boy of Jesse Jackson. And so, yeah. So here it is. I'm an 80s baby. So that's right, that's right. We ain't too old just yet. And of course, growing up in the 80s, you knew who Jesse Jackson was. But did I really know who Jesse Jackson was? Not really. It's only been in my freshman term that I've actually gotten to know him so much better. And he probably doesn't know this, but his son and I have traveled to numerous countries together since we've been serving. And we now have this running joke because there's always someone in the world that knows who Jesse Jackson is. And as soon as they find out that Jonathan is his son, they have a story. And I'm talking about in Asia, I'm talking about in the Middle East, anywhere that we go, they know who Jesse Jackson is. There are people that have met him. It is, this is when I truly felt like I was starting to get to know who Jesse Jackson truly was because his impact has not been limited to any city, state, or even country. He has actually transcended it all. But here it is, we're here because my pastor, who I call my petty pastor, <laughs> he said I was gonna have to be here, but I wouldn't have missed it. Because most people don't understand what it is to have a pastor like Pastor Haynes. Clap it up. You know, Reverend Al got y'all all riled up, and we know we got, we got a lot of different pastors in this world nowadays. Can I get an amen? But I have been so fortunate because in my legislative career, I have had a pastor that's been by my side, riling people up, <laughs> organizing, strategizing, from Austin to DC. In fact, I know a lot of these Republicans look around and they probably ask questions when I go off on them and they wonder whether or not I got Jesus <laughs> and whether or not I got a pastor. And I think to myself, if y'all only knew, <laughs> time he'd be one of the first ones to text me egging me on. <laughs> if y'all only knew that my pastor not only organized when we left the state, we left Austin, we went to DC, all about voting rights, what did he do? He had my back. In fact, he had all our backs, let me be clear. And he organized pastors and he got people to Austin. And even when we were outside of the state, he wanted to make sure that there were voices in that house and they were going to be raised and our issues were going to be heard. That's what he did. But it don't stop there. Because after that, he decided, you know what? I'm coming to DC. And he did. And we marched there. Y'all, he even went to jail. He didn't tell me he was going to go to jail. He went to jail as well. Listen, I don't know another congresswoman that has the benefit of having a pastor that will not only pray for her, but will walk beside her and march for the people. So, when it came time to come and say just a couple of words, which I'm supposed to be saying welcome. <laughs> so welcome. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't miss it. But I started this off by saying that this is a time of transition. And the question is, what will the transformation look like? And I'm here to tell you that the transformation is up to all of us. 
I don't want y'all calling my pastor thinking that he gonna do it all by himself. Did y'all hear that in the back? I don't want y'all calling my pastor thinking he gonna do it by himself. There is no movement that doesn't take all of us. You have already heard from a number of people talking about how they marched with each other, how they worked with each other. There goes CK. Listen, I know a bunch of the people in this room because they are true to this, not new to this. And the same can be said for my pastor. But if we are going to make sure that the transformation is something that we believe in, something we can be proud of, then what I need y'all to do is recognize that the power lies with the people. It lies with each and every one of you. So while I am so proud of my pastor and he's going to be leading Rainbow Push, I need y'all to know that he needs every single one of y'all in this fight with him. Thank you. Good evening. How many of you are woke tonight? How many, we got many woke people in the place? Jesse Jackson was woke before woke was woke. Y'all sing along with me. It's a familiar song. It's one you all know real well. Change the world. We gotta 
world, change it, change the world, change the world. Give it up one more time for Vincent Hall. Look, we know we got a lot of important folks uh, in the audience, so I want to make sure that we can acknowledge you. Uh, if you are an elected official that is not on the program and not going to get a chance to come up here with us this evening, if you could please stand if you are an elected official. Please stand. You may be seated. Rainbow Push has always been faith-fueled, and there are many faith leaders as well and colleagues of Reverend Jackson and Haynes who have traveled from near and far to be here. If you could please stand at this time. I think they heard me. Thank you. We would also like to acknowledge our sponsors. This night would not be possible without them at all. So up first, Sound Design Studios. Jesus Exalted and Word Explained Eastern Star Church. Friendship West Church. <laughs> Paul Quinn College. The Black Academy of Arts and Letters. And St. Sabina. Give a round of applause for all of our sponsors. Hey, a reminder, by the way, tonight's event is just the kickoff to all of what we're hap that we have happening, I should say, this weekend. Tomorrow at Paul Quinn College, a powerful social justice conference will take place. Now, Haynes was determined, okay, that the events of the inauguration have a community connection. Y'all know how we roll. So we are in the historic Black Academy of Arts and Letters tonight under the leadership of the great Curtis King. Curtis, can you stand up so that we can recognize you? I don't know if he's in the room, but y'all know who Curtis King is. So, y'all can do better than that. Give it up again for Curtis King. <laughs> Tomorrow, the Social Justice Conference will take place on the former campus of Bishop College, where Haynes matriculated, Pledge Alpha Phi Alpha, as a member, oh yeah, of the Epsilon Gamma, graduated, of course, and the first, and first I should say, met Reverend, I knew that was going to get y'all hyped up. Go ahead with your old six, go ahead, one more time. I already knew. baby I already knew okay y'all gonna cut up that's how we gonna do okay y'all know we got to move on through this program tonight look at Bishop College that is where he first met Reverend Jackson and it is now known as Paul Quinn College the conference will cast a vision of where Rainbow Push is going and feature some outstanding presenters activists and leaders Tamika Mallory will be there Pastor Mike McBride, Jennifer Jones Austin, who you heard from earlier, Pastor Tish Dixon Williams, former Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr., and of course, Reverend Haynes. That conference begins at 9 a.m. You already know it's going to be a powerful experience. Now we will have greetings from someone who I would call a mentor to so many young journalists, including myself, someone unafraid to speak truth to power and who will always, y'all know this man, going to always pull out those receipts to back it up. Award-winning journalist, activist, author, founder, and host of Roland Martin Unfiltered. Please help me welcome Roland Martin. All right, Dallas, how we doing? Uh, first of all, uh, Tashar, that was trifling how you just tried to, that, that little... One nine, that was just like awful. Uh, and CJ, don't think for a second, when you ever mention Alpha, you don't mention no other youth groups. <laughs> don't, just go ahead, just want to get y'all know. <laughs> I said, did she sit here and say Alpha, then she threw in Omegas and the mother little Kappas? I was like, CJ want to get cussed out. <laughs> Good to see Reverend. I know he's going to throw his little mega hooks up. That's that I call the fly away symbol. Yeah. 
You know that's the flyaway symbol. You know what that is. You know it. You know it. You know Jesus is an alpha. Don't start. Just letting y'all know. So, uh, and so since the shard messed it up, we're going to do this thing right. 119. That's how you do it. Just remember, Alpha's your daddy. It's Alpha and the Divine Eight. All right, let's get right to it. <laughs> I am, um, I'm glad to be here. When I walked up, Reverend Haynes said, man, I thought you would have had an African outfit on. I said, well, first of all, uh, you ain't tell me about no dress code. <laughs> Two, I had to do my show. Uh, and then three, uh, I was back there and I said, y'all not streaming the event? I said, no. I said, well, luckily I did my show. So we've actually been live streaming uh, this event. Um, and they kept bugging me saying, we you backstage. I said, yeah, but I got to run the camera because it's just me. Because, um, and again, when you own it, when you own the network, you can do what you want. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing it. Before I share a few words, Reverend Haynes asked me to, uh, first of all, of course, when I was a member of Friendship West Baptist Church when I was here in Dallas, uh, and uh, he just got here in Houston. I was a member of Church Without Walls through Calvary Baptist Church, so Reverend Ralph Douglas West is back there, so he's here. Another alpha man. Um, and um, Reverend Haynes hit me and he asked me to speak about, share a few words about the importance of working by the deal with black-owned media. And um, many of you, many of you um, may not know, um, it was our story tonight, right before I went live uh, tonight, got the word that uh, we lost one of the greatest voices that we have ever known for black folks, the Black Eagle Joe Madison. It's now an ancestor. Joe passed away, second bout with prostate cancer. So um, before, we, uh, before I speak, just uh, take a moment to pray for his wife, pray for his children, um, and all the folks who listen to the Black Eagle every single day. Thanks so much. March 16th, 1827, the nation's first black newspaper was launched. It's called Freedom's Journal. In the third paragraph, they said, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. And when you listen, Reverend Sharpton talked about how we got here, all the things that we did. He mentioned the various things going from slavery through Reconstruction, through Jim Crow, through the second Reconstruction, the black freedom movement. The reality is we do not get to this place in our history if we did not have a real thriving black owned media. We are not standing here without Frederick Douglass's The North Star. We're not standing here without Ida B. Wells Barnett. She was so feared that they blew up her newspaper. And that's why today there's no physical copy of one of her papers because they had a bounty on her head because she dared to write about lynching. When you talk about the Pittsburgh Courier, you talk about the Chicago Defender founded by Robert Abbott, you talk about A.I. Scott, the Atlanta Daily World, when you talk about all of uh, these black media outlets, Ebony and Jet Magazine, when you talk about black enterprise in essence, and we can go on present day, BET, TV One, talk about uh, black radio, black newspaper, our voices were completely ignored on mainstream media. And so black media was there, black owned media was there covering our stories, carrying the issues. One of the reasons why Reverend Jackson was able to do what he did with Rainbow Push Coalition because John H. Johnson made sure that he was in Jet Magazine every single week. He was in Ebony Magazine. And I say that because a whole lot of us, if we want to be real honest, a lot of us today fall for white validation in that we will quickly run to ABC, NBC, CNN, Fox News, uh, MSNBC to get two to three minutes and literally will bypass black owned media every day until we get in trouble. 
For you see, we're asking them for permission to come on when, when you look at black owned, we actually set the agenda. And, and understand how we can be just as viable. Understand that when we talk about live streaming in this, it's being streamed with a live U, LU800, which is the top of the line live streaming unit. When we go out live, uh, all the networks have the exact same thing, and we own two of them. And when people see what we do, they say, oh my goodness, your stuff looks great. I'm like, well, what did you expect it to look like? We can buy 4K cameras like they can. But we're not able to participate uh, in the $340 billion that's spent annually in advertising when black-owned media is getting 0.5 to 1%. When BET was sold 22 years ago, it was 1% then, and it's still 1% today. And so we have to understand that if we are going to be thriving in this century, we've got to be willing to support black-owned outlets who are there for us at every turn, covering us when we barely have the resources to actually do it. So whether it's black newspapers here in Dallas, whether it's black radio, whether what we do nationally, every person here has to make a decision as to whether or not we're going to cultivate our own because, again, let me be perfectly clear, MSNBC, we watch them more than anybody else. They ain't back there. We love to watch the black folks on ABC Good Morning America. They ain't back there. We love when we go, oh, so-and-so's on CNN. They're not back there. In fact, it's one, two, three cameras. The local news camera was over here. They left. And I'm saying all of that because if we are talking about a movement and supporting what Reverend Haynes is doing, understand black-owned media is going to be there like we were there for Reverend Jackson, like we were there for Dr. King, like we were there for Ella Baker, like we were there for Diane Nash, like we were there for Reverend Jim Lawson. We have always been here, and let's be perfectly clear, when they give us a few minutes, we can spend 30 minutes and an hour talking about the issues and breaking those things down. And so if we are going to be willing to stand Reverend Haynes, as he is moving forward to take the helm of Rainbow Push, it is going to require this generation of black folks to do what no other generation has done, and that is allow black owned media to die. We literally are on the precipice of being extinct. I don't think y'all understand. When the CBC comes to me and they say, Man, when we come out of our meeting, there are no African-American, there's no black-owned media out here. I said, because we can't afford to pay somebody 100000 just to cover Congress. And I said to the CBC, but a billion dollars is spent every year by the federal government on advertising. And if y'all would do more to make sure that we get more than that 1% of the billion dollars, then I said, I'll be real clear. If I got 5% of the $1 billion, I have three people hired in the next 90 days. I'm still waiting. And so the challenge for us is to support our own and for black folks who are sitting on boards of directors and black folks who are senior executives. I'm going to say it like it needs to be said. I've never witnessed black folk protect white corporate money harder than they do. Yet when the same black folk get fired, they want to call me to cover their story. Or, like today, we got a phone call from a brother who got fired, and he said, do y'all have any openings? And we said, in three years you've been there, and we've gotten zero, and you looking for us for a job? Now, I know that's a little uncomfortable for some folks. But understand this. Dr. King said this in Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. He said there are four institutions that are positioned to liberate black America. The Negro Church, the Negro Press, Negro Fraternities and Sororities, Negro Professional Business Organizations. He specifically says that for the Negro Press, they must remain militant and focus on the substantive and not the sensational and the conservative. That's literally what he wrote. And so if you expect us to speak unapologetically and unfiltered, 
If you expect us to challenge power, if you expect us to stand up for you, then we've got to make sure that black folks in Dallas and in Texas and in this country actually support a black owned media. Enough of surviving. Now is the time to be thriving. And so we have the opportunity to rewrite history. We have the opportunity, since we supposedly are the smartest and the richest collection of black folks in the history of this country, this is the moment for us to stand up and say, we are going to create an ecosystem that speaks for us, that represents us, that is going to stand for us, that is going to fight for us. And let me be perfectly clear, when it comes to fighting, Folk know how I roll. I don't work. I don't have any boss but God. Literally, I don't ask anybody. Can I go cover? When Reverend Haynes called me, I didn't ask nobody. I ain't asked my wife, my mama, or my daddy. Cause when you own it, you ain't got to ask nobody. And so we are going to continue the fight, continue the battle, and like now the great Alpha, the founder, one of the seven Jews, Vertner Woods and Tandy said, we will fight until hell freezes over and then we will fight on the ice now i knew roland was gonna get out here and cut up i told y'all he gonna have them receipts that's one thing he gonna always have all right so i want to keep this thing moving we're a little bit behind schedule dr amos c brown is who we have up next Yes, of course, a national board member of the NAACP and the pastor of Reverend Haynes, who licensed, as, licensed, I should say, and ordained him to the ministry. Dr. Brown has served as pastor of, pastor of the historic Third Baptist Church in San Francisco for 47 years. He was also a leader of the presidential campaigns for Reverend Jackson in 84 and 88. Harry Johnson Esquire will follow Dr. Brown. Attorney Johnson is president and CEO of the MLK Memorial Foundation in Washington, D.C. Now, under his leadership, the only monument to an African-American on the mall in Washington, D.C. was built. Absolutely. You can give him a round of applause for that. Now, it's appropriate that we segue from Harry Johnson to receive greetings from some of our Divine Nine organizations. We will hear from the South Central Region Director of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Joya T. Hayes, Elsie Cook-Holmes, the International President and Chair of the Board of Directors of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She will favor us with greetings as well. Alpha Phi Alpha General President Willis Lonzer was to bring us greetings, but his flight has been delayed for most of the day in Chicago. Boy, it's been a mess at the airports all day. We're not going to go there, so we're going to follow that up with a video presentation to follow the greetings from President Cook's homes. Okay, please welcome to the stage Dr. Amos C. Brown. Good evening. To our mistress of ceremonies, all of the dignitaries who are gathered, especially to this first family. The Haynes, Oliver families. My longtime friend, Reverend Dr. Jesse Lewis Jackson. <clears throat> whom I have known since 1961. When I was in Chicago and saw the object of a man hanging out of a window directing 
a demonstration. And since that day, he has not left his well-deserved role as one of the greatest leaders to be found anywhere south of heaven, north of hell. Let's give it up again for Reverend Dr. Jackson. I just wish to hasten and say that I can't find words to express how proud and privileged I am to be here to share with this so rare, so debonair, and divinely anointed leader, Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III. With the exception of his mother, who birthed him, and Miss Leona Bridges, who's a distinct member of the historic Third Baptist Church of San Francisco, I have known Dr. Haynes longer than all of you. And I call to your attention the words of Tennyson in Ulysses. When he said, I am a part of all that I have met. That is to suggest we become who we are on the basis of the meetings that we have in our lives. And Dr. Haynes has risen to this fateful evening not because he grabbed for it or he elbowed his way up. Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III was, as I said, the very night when I ordained him. He was the one on whom the prophetic mantle would fall. And Dr. Haynes, I thank God that you began before that night wearing that mantle of leadership when at Providence Baptist Church in San Francisco the black community had gathered because in that so-called progressive liberal city Black administrators and teachers were not receiving fair opportunities to be leaders in that district. They were not getting fair wages. Students from the black community were underachieving at the bottom of the well. That night, the Spirit led me to realize some wisdom that I achieved in Mississippi. And that wisdom says that if you want to plow a field successfully, you don't ever team up two old mules to plow by themselves. And neither do you team up two young mules to ply by themselves. But you always team up an old mule and a young mule if you want to have a successful ply. So that night, God bless my soul, when everybody who was over 50, I believe, had spoken, I said as the presiding officer, we need to make this movement intergenerational. 
There is Frederick Douglass Haynes over there, a student at Lincoln High School. Come on up here, Frederick, and have a word to say tonight. And I tell you, as he's doing so eloquently today, in his tender young years, he got the house. The women threw their purses. <laughs> Babies jumped up and started shouting. Old folks put down their canes and ran around Providence Church. And from that day, I have greatly, greatly appreciated that he wore the mantle well and he never stopped doing it in a superlative way. What is distinct about that mantle? I just mentioned this one thing because there are others to speak. Dr. Haynes, I commend you because you have used your head for more than a hat rack. It was the person whose name you bear, Frederick Douglass who said one day during his day that A.M.E. Zion preacher, and many of y'all don't know that Frederick Douglass was not just a hell raiser or just a, a, an abolitionist, he was a licensed A.M.E. Zion preacher. And Harry Tubman was his sidekick in good trouble. But Frederick Douglass said, education renders a man a woman incapable of being a slave. Dr. Haynes has his BA degree, got his Master's of Divinity, got that doctorate from that great and prestigious university in London, England. But I tell you, he, though he is learned, but he's not arrogant, and he doesn't show off with his learning. For he uses his intellect to say, if I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain. If I can bring back beauty to a world once wrought, then my living shall not be in vain. Dr. Haynes, you are the man for this hour, for such a time as this. Because right now, in these United States of America, there are persons who are trying to make us not use our heads. That man from down there in Florida, Mr. DeSantis, wanted to be president of the United States of America. But I tell you, he's not eligible and he doesn't qualify because he failed to realize that we are the people who will not listen to anyone to tell us to realize, not to realize, that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And we thank you, Doc, that you have lived in such a way that all of your efforts have not been for analysis. But you are a practitioner, and as an educator, you have turned your very church into a schoolhouse in which children will say, glad will I learn, and glad will I teach others how to find the way to the good life. I end with this by saying, this night, you are a man for this hour in this nation. For we have a serious situation, a terrible situation, in which we are on the brinks of going the way of ancient Rome. The Roman Empire, the seven hills of Rome, are no more. Why are they no more? Because there was injustice in the empire. 
because there was privilege for the Caesars only. There was in the empire the inability to even rebuild their infrastructure. Dr. Haynes, the system is broken. The nation is sick and it is critical and on the list that leads to death. But you can be that agent whom God will use to save the soul of this nation, to make sure that America is one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hold your hope, Dr. Haynes. Use that good mind. Keep on helping everybody. Stand on the wall. Be a preacher and a prophet and not a puppet to any system. Stand on the wall and make sure that nobody will turn you around. For God has been too good to you, brought you from too far. That teacher said, you will not be anything over there in Lincoln High School and told you, quit because your English lesson was not fulfilled. But you kept on fighting even after you lost your daddy. You kept on fighting and you are standing tonight as a Moses of our generation, as a Joshua coming forth to lead us in such a time as this. Thank God tonight we got the right leader for my friend Jesse Jackson. Thank God tonight you're going to lead on until the day will come when all of God's children will be able to say, I'm black and I'm proud. I'm brown and I'm sound. I'm yellow and I'm mellow. I'm red, but I ain't dead. I'm white, but I'm all right. I'm a woman, but I'm wise. I'm gay, but I'm godly. I'm straight, but I'm sensible. I'm an immigrant, but I'm industrious. Lead on, Brother Freddie. You are the man for the hour. Good evening, good evening. Give it up one more time for Reverend Brown, please. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Freddie D. Haynes III, I am honored uh, as a president of the CEO and the CEO of the Memorial Foundation, a former National General President of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, and as your friend, to bring greetings to you on this day, a day made for you, a place made for you here tonight. I would be remiss if I did not ask Reverend Dr. Joe Samuel Ratliff, the Vice Chair of the Memorial Foundation Board, to please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Haynes, you are my friend, deserves this honor and many, many more. You're not one to seek fame and honor, but rather one who seeks justice and fairness for those who are sometimes voiceless, sometimes hopeless, and those who just seek to have a voice and a place at the table. We say thank you. What I've admired about you is that you always have time for those who seek to do the right thing. As Dr. King once proclaimed, the time is always right to do what is right, and you have done that all of your life. We thank you so much, Dr. Haynes. You know, on a personal note, you have always been there for me, for the foundation, and for Alpha Phi Alpha. You, should all, you all should know that Friendship West, under his direction, was a major donor to what we now know as the fifth most visited memorial in Washington, D.C., the Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial. And Friendship West and Dr. Freddie Haynes helped us to raise $127 million to build that memorial on the mall. We say thank you. What you don't know is that the trials and tribulations that we went through to build that doggone thing. I can't tell all the stories, but I'll tell this one. As we were preparing for the dedication, we met at the Washington Cathedral, the National Cathedral with 
the right reverend Grace Mary, or whatever her name was. So I went to meet with her like I knew what I was going to talk about. I'm just a lawyer. So I said, let me go in and tell her that we want the podium. We want to put a light where Dr. King spoke, and words are going to be said. And then she started, well, Mr. Johnson, tell me what words are going to be spoken. I said, hell, I don't know. <laughs> she did say, well, tell me the purpose of the words and how they intertwine with all this, Reverend Jackson. And I said, hell, I don't know. I said, Reverend Mary, Reverend Grace Mary, whatever your name is, I'm just a poor lawyer trying to get to heaven. But give me two weeks and I'll be back. I left there. I called Dr. Ratliff. I said, can you beat me in Washington at uh, two weeks? He said, I'll be there. I called Dr. Freddie Howe. I said, can you meet me in D.C. in two weeks? And they both showed up. We went over to the National Cathedral. And by the time them two Negroes finished going up and down Reverend Mother Mary, she said, y'all could do and have anything y'all want to do. And then she said, Mr. Johnson, you didn't tell me you was bringing two members of the Holy Trinity with you. I said, well, now you know what Alpha Phi Alpha men could do and what we could say. God bless you, my brother. Keep up the great work. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Joya Hayes, and I am so proud to serve as the South Central Regional Director for Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Will the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha please stand? Turn around, Pastor, let you see the beauty that is Alpha Kappa Alpha here to support you today. Now, Pastor, in addition to being a leader of Alpha Kappa Alpha, I am also what this program needs, and that is a Methodist who can get on and off the stage to keep it moving. You see, as a Methodist, I know how to beat y'all to Lubies so I can get to the Luann Platter. And so as I come before you today to celebrate you, I'm going to be in and out. As the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha celebrate Freddie Haynes, I reflected on your work. I reflected on the, your charge for the future, and I was reminded of a book that I just read called How Far to the Promised Land. And in that book, there's a chapter titled, If You're Scared, Go to Church. If You're Scared, Go to Church. And this book chronicles the upbringing of a black church man who tells a story that every time he went to church and the pastor got up to preach, the sermons always had what he called a destination. They always headed somewhere. This evening, as we celebrate a visionary man, a dynamic man of purpose, a man of God, I have the distinct feeling that what we're about to accomplish here is going to be something that takes us somewhere in the future. Over the civil rights movement, we've always been moving forward, looking for that opportunity to reach what we hope to be the promised land. As we move forward, we the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha, we the women of the church, we the women of the community recognize that no matter how much we have done, there is still so much work to do. Education, poverty, infant mortality, voting rights, social justice. Many of us are asking today as we create an opportunity to give another man an opportunity to lead us, we ask ourselves the question, how far is the promised land? We don't necessarily know how far it is, but on behalf of the women who have been celebrating for 116 years, we recognize that many of you all may have visions of what an Alpha Kappa Alpha woman is, but let me give you the remixed version of who we are in 2024. We're not just women that are pretty because we recognize the ugliness of society. We're not women that are just excited to put on a pretty dress because we recognize that the work we must do in our communities to ensure that our children are respected and educated is something that's certainly not cute. But we recognize that as women of Alpha Kappa Alpha, today we celebrate a man who's going to take us far. 
How far, as far as our imaginations will take us. How far, as far as we will allow him the support, the funding, and the spiritual support that he needs. How far, as far as we are willing to sacrifice ourselves for the cause of liberation and bettering our community. Things will get tough. As we've heard from so many of the speakers, we're living in scary times. But our Bible tells us that he that cometh to God must come believing that he lives and that he is a rewarder for them that diligently seek him. And so today, the ladies in pink and green, stand up one more time, let them see you. Like grandma used to say, let them see you. We, the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha, both here and abroad, the 300,000 women who have been celebrating the work for 216 years support you, sir. And we recognize that this is not a journey that will be easy. But we, the women of AKA, we're not about those cute journeys. We're not Frappuccino sitting in Lexus kind of journey women. We are that old school van that just had the air conditioning in the front with the cooler in the back with the sandwiches in the foil that was stuck to it, them old school trips. Recognizing that grandma told us, don't eat too much and don't drink too much because we're not stopping until we get to our final destination. Freddie Haynes, the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha are here with you and we're not gonna move too fast or drink too fast because we recognize that we are here to do the work and we're here to do it in ways that represent the history of our organization and the future of our community. And no matter our comfort, our luxury, our space, we recognize that this journey will continue and I am proud to say and represent the 300,000 women of Alpha Kappa Alpha, when we say to you that with every step, every action, and every strategy, we are here to follow you to the promised land. Thank you. The Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, members of the Rainbow Push Coalition leadership, other civic leaders, clergy, all assembled, good evening. I am Elsie Cook Holmes, International President and Chair of the Board of Directors of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And I stand here on behalf of the more than 350,000 initiated members and over 1,050 chapters chartered worldwide. Will the members of Delta Sigma Theta assembled here tonight please stand? Thank you. I know you all would. Sh I know you all would show up. I know you all would show up. Absolutely, absolutely. Because Deltas all over this country were elated with the appointment of Dr. Haynes as the president and CEO of the Rainbow Bush Coalition. Those in the DFW area were extra excited that our community activists, nationally renowned but local pastor, and most importantly, for us anyway, the husband of a Delta. The son of a Delta. But we are excited that you are taking the helm of this auspicious organization. I know your congregation is full of members of Delta Sigma Theta, but you are a favorite to us all over Delta Sigma Theta, as you've spoken for our nat preach for our national conventions, our Delta days in the nation's capital, as you energized us to carry out our social justice agenda. We also proudly marched together last summer during the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. It was a wonderful time for us to commemorate the march and the life and legacy of Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
And we as Deltas also pushed forward in the footsteps of our founders who marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in 1913 during the Women's Suffrage March, and we are still fighting for voting rights. Rainbow Push Coalition and Delta Sigma Theta had the same mission, to help the lost, the least, and the left out. As a service organization founded in 1913, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated has clearly distinguished itself as a public service organization that boldly confronts the challenges of African Americans and hence all Americans. The mission of the Rainbow Push Coalition is to protect, defend, and gain civil rights by leveling the economic and educational playing fields and to promote peace and justice around the world. Therefore, both organizations are side by side in this fight to eliminate social ills for all people. The words of Mordecai to Queen Esther in the book of Esther holds true for you, Dr. Haynes. You have been elevated, selected, and chosen to lead the Rainbow Push Coalition for such a time as this. There is no one better suited to carry the mantle forward of the Rainbow Push Coalition following in the footsteps of the Reverend Jesse Jackson. The first line of that scripture says, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for your people will arise for, from another place. This is no time to be silent. It is time to us to put out the clarion call to action for all civic and civil rights organizations. All of us must work together with one mission to serve as a voice for the voiceless, an advocate for peace and justice for all. We need to do as your mission states to make the American dream a reality for all Americans, not just some. The stakes are high in this 2024 presidential election year, and our collective efforts are needed now more than ever. We have to put the action in social action to our various initiatives, registering voters, getting out the vote, spreading awareness on important issues, educating the community on these oppressive voting laws, and elevating the voices of the community in the quest for a more equitable and just future. As we commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, at a time that our civil rights are being stripped every day, the call for our collective power is needed more than ever. It's going to take each and every one of us. We must stand together. We must stand together. And in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, we are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. So Dr. Haynes, we congratulate you. We look forward to working with you, partnering with you. We will pray for you daily. And just know that the road ahead, especially during this time, for such a time as this, will not be easy. So may God continue to bless and keep you. And just know that the ladies of Crimson and Cream will be in the battle with you. And we know when we fight, we win. Okay, you guys, you are not looking at a ghost, but this is what we mean when we say brotherhood. Alpha Phi Alpha General President Dr. Willis Lanzer made it from his flight in Chicago. We thought he wasn't going to make it, but he pulled right on up. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Lanzer. Good evening. Good evening to all of the distinguished guests who are assembled. Reverend Jackson, I see you there. To Dr. Haynes, my esteemed brother. Not only could United Airlines not keep me away, but I think the Lord put a tailwind behind us because we got here mighty fast. I'm calling on tonight much in the spirit of Alpha Phi Alpha from the days when Reverend Dr. Haynes walked the campus of Bishop Epsilon Gamma Chapter, 1979, when this brother came in. I'm calling all alphas to the floor like we used to do. We got some here, but we need some more. With all the men of Alpha Phi Alphas in the room, on the planet, please stand.
All right. Thank you, brothers. As the general president of the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, representing over 300,000 men who have been initiated since our inception at Cornell University in 1906, I've come tonight to do in the spirit of our ancestors the rallying call of our clan, of our brotherhood, behind our leader, our esteemed brother, Dr. Haynes. Not only are you a prolific preacher, dynamic leader, but you espouse the very essential and quintessential aspects of being an alpha man. You represent metaphorically, along with many of the great poems and prose that we learn, that the test of a man is the fight that he makes, the grit that he daily shows, the way he stands upon his feet and takes life's numerous bumps and blows. You also espouse the very tenets of one of our essential poems that although it was penned by a racist in Sir Rudyard Kipling, still characterizes the essential aspects of adulthood, manhood. And you, my brother, can talk with crowds and keep your virtue and also walk with kings nor lose the common touch. You, my brother, have been selected to lead this essential organization in the assembly of the Rainbow Push Coalition. As a Chicagoan, I recognize the importance and significance of the work that you now are becoming the head and will lead moving forward. You will not forget the roots that are there because you as an alpha man have always been entrenched in the understanding and the significance of history. But you do not look back. You only look forward. You are planted by those streams that will replenish you. So tonight, your brothers around the world are looking to Dallas, Texas to say to you, we are with you. We stand with you. The old gold and black will be resiliently behind you, under you, above you, and going along with you. Only the Lord will be before you. And we know that he will not fail you. Much like the scripture says that we know his word goes forward, but it does not return void. So as you plant those seeds, know that you don't have to look around because you will feel us on every side, that the men of Alpha Phi Alpha are here and we are with you. God's speed, God's blessings, and have a great evening. Malcolm X said we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. And you do recognize everything that's legal ain't necessarily just. It's a whole lot of stuff that's legal, but God knows it ain't just. The Dred Scott decision of what, 1857, it was legal, but it was not just. You do know that Plessy versus Ferguson was legal, but it was not just. Y'all do know the crime bill, it was legal, but it was not just. Three strikes and you're out is legal, but God knows it ain't just slavery was legal but it was not just apartheid was legal but it was not just because we're guilty of having prayers without feet we're guilty of missing what the bible says and that faith without works is dead and so we wasting a whole lot of time with our kumbaya moments to be it resolved that black people have been in a state of emergency when it comes to injustice, arbitrary and abusive policing systems, economic disparities, poverty, failing school systems, and the vicious assault on our voting rights. And we come to you in the name of our resurrected revolution, yeah. Jesus the Christ, who knows what it means to march on a capital.
He marched on Jerusalem and yeah. turned out the money changers. Yes, sir. He marched on yes, sir. And we're going to turn out anyone engaged in voter suppression. Yes, sir. The lie about critical race theory. We're going to turn you out. And because we are turned on and turned up by our Lord and Savior. Yes, sir. All I'm going to say is turn up. Because public policy ensured that black people would be positioned or segregated into communities that were floodplains. Black people would move into communities that were then divested. Black people and brown people find themselves going to schools that are underfunded, overcrowded. Why? Because all of that is the result of public policy and a resolution is not going to get rid of a policy that has left our community broken. If you go honor Dr. King, don't live in his nightmare, but really push for his dream of justice in public policy. Such a time as this. We will keep this program moving. We're going to receive greetings from two outstanding faith leaders. Dr. Cynthia Hell is the founder and pastor of the Ray of Hope Christian Church in Decatur, Georgia. She is also the second woman to serve as the president of the prestigious Hampton Ministers Conference at Hampton University. Dr. Hell will be followed by community activist, justice warrior, Rabbi Nancy Caston. Caston serves as the chief relationship officer, Faith Commons, and she was People Newspapers 2023 Person of the Year. Please receive Dr. Cynthia Hell. Good evening. Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes III and Mrs. Deborah Peak Haynes. Reverend Jesse L. Jackson and Mrs. Jacqueline Jackson. Thank you for all that you have given. And all the other very important people in the room, all of you, my brothers and sisters. I came to Dallas to witness with you the installation of my friend, my brother, my colleague, as the president and chief executive officer of Rainbow Push Coalition a civil rights organization that has a long, rich history of making a difference in our nation and world through its fight for freedom and justice for all. I've had the good fortune of working with Dr. Haynes, Freddie, through the years, having founded with him and Jeremiah Wright, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, and also working with him on the IC3 board. I have seen him up close and personal. I know him to be a man of integrity, a man of his word, a man who will do exactly what he says he is going to do. I have seen his incredible mind at work. Sometimes it blows my mind to see the imagination of Frederick Douglass Haynes III. And the way that he creates on his feet is amazing to me and to all of us. I've watched your stellar leadership through the years for the cause of justice that has prepared and set you up for this moment. There is no better person to lead this organization. You've already heard it said that he is a prophet. God said to you like he said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. There's nobody in the world like Freddie D. Hayes. Nobody has the swag. Nobody has the suave bula like he does. Nobody can talk the talk and walk the walk like Freddie Haynes. And so as you take over this organization with the rich heritage that was established by our good friend, Reverend Jackson, 
We know that you will add your own special flavor to it. The Freddie Haynes effect. So as you move fully into it, my brother, know that I and all of your colleagues who are here pledge to pray for you, stand with you, to support you, not only with our lips, but with our lives and with our money. God bless you. I'm overwhelmed and overjoyed by the honor of being here to offer greetings tonight on this incredible, wonderful occasion. Greetings not only myself, but also on behalf of all of the leaders of the community of all faiths and denominations that have worked with Dr. Haynes for so many years. Dr. Haynes and I, neither of us are native to Dallas, and we often wonder to each other why we've stayed all these years. <laughs> uh, and we keep each other going. Um, and I'm going to give you one short example of that. Um, April 20th, 2021, Dr. Haynes and I met in the office of the Chief of Police in Dallas. That was the date that Derek Chauvin's trial was ending and the verdict was going to be announced. And everyone was afraid that rioting would break out, there would be violence, and Dr. Haynes invited me to go visit with the police chief to ask that he try to calm the police down and just pay attention to what was actually going on. And, you know, first of all, Dr. Haynes invited me in to be a part of that conversation, and then he invited me to be part of inviting the police chief in to strategize about how we could keep the peace in the city better. And that, to me, epitomizes his style, his magic, the reason that he is the person to be the unifier at a time when division is tearing us apart and making it impossible for any of our groups, our people, our loved ones, our communities to thrive. So. So we all, as so many have said before this evening, we all need to be part of this um, work of bringing people in, not calling them out, of working together, of recognizing that we need one another, that we're not alone in that room with the police chief. I know that black Americans have a unique struggle in this fight, but we can be your partners or even just your friends, know that you're not alone. And I just want to say in closing to offer this blessing for Dr. Haynes and his family at this time, the blessing offered by the priests on Zion's Mount centuries ago. May God bless you and keep you. May the light of God's countenance always shine upon you and be gracious to you. Shalom. May God's presence always be with you, and may you be wrapped in this incredible love and knowledge that we are one and that we want to bring peace with you, for you, and for all. Amen. Okay, we have made it to the point that I know so many of us have been looking forward to this evening. Y'all know Reverend Haynes is a, is a family man, right? Okay, he loves his family. So without further ado, we're not going to hear from his family, his lovely wife and daughter. They're going to introduce the new president of Rainbow Push. Please give him a round of applause. Deborah P. Haynes. A health and wellness advocate is going to join me on the stage, and his daughter, Abney Jewel Haynes, is an actor and communication specialist. Please again receive the wife and daughter of Reverend Haynes. Hello. 
my mom make, made me come out here first by myself. Uh, but greetings to all of you. I have been given the honor of presenting my best friend, my father. Reverend Dr. Frederick D. Haynes III is one of the kindest souls you will ever meet. Most are surprised to know that he is an introvert, but he doesn't let that take away from making each person he comes in contact with feel important. You could ask the dozens of members he greets after preaching his heart out Sunday after Sunday. He leads with love, believes in and fights for the best of humanity, and always strives to stand on the right side of his and her story. He stands ten toes down in the fight for equality and justice. We can especially see this as he has masterfully carried the torch of justice and faith-based leadership from those who are now in the cloud of witnesses. Cherished ancestors, like Reverend Dr. Frederick D. Haynes, Sr., Reverend Frederick D. Haynes, Jr., Dr. Manuel Scott, Sr., Dr. Charles Adams, Dr. Manuel Scott, Sr., Dr. Gardner C. Taylor, the Reverend John Magrum, the Reverend Dr. William Augustus Jones, Dr. Frederick Sanson, Ms. Homazelle Davis, and countless others. I know for a fact that gospel heavyweights and activist legends like Dr. Jeremiah Wright Jr., Dr. Harry S. Wright, Dr. Amos Brown, and Dr. Zan Wesley Holmes are filled with so much joy to see how he has used the wisdom gained from each of them to grow in faith, ministry, activism, leadership, and so much more. And I am sure that his other and the original best friend, my godfather, Marvis P, excuse me, Marvis May, <laughs> is so happy to see the strides my dad has taken since their days at the good old Bishop Blue. My dad has inherited and grown even more from the academic genius of his mother, Lynetta Haynes Oliver. give her spill on how he is a loving and funny husband. And, you know, to be quite honest, I was trying to come up with an eloquent and clever sentence to describe how he is a father, but the truth of the matter is there are no words. He's just great. Dad, I am very proud of you. You are a wordsmith, one who is often imitated but can never be duplicated. You have a brilliant mind. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to see through my tears. It's so amazing how you can write out an entire sermon and then speak the gospel with no notes. <laughs> You're the only preacher I know and have seen to remix scripture so the general audience can really capture God's word. You are one of, no, excuse me, the best preacher south of heaven. You are a modern day drum major for justice, a great example of what a distinguished man of Alpha Phi Alpha is. You are simply one of a kind. It's an honor to be able to present you, and before I go, Please know, and I need everybody in this room to know this, I will always have his back. May God protect you and keep you as you take on this new role. I love you. Thank you very much. Isn't she lovely? We're just so proud of Albany. Well, good evening to everyone, and thank you so much for sharing this very special moment. And we appreciate your support of my wonderful husband. 
Good to see you, Dr. Uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson. Thanks for making the trip and your family and board members to all of you. Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III is a son, husband, father, brother, family man, and good friend to many. Most of all, he is God's child that accepted the call to ministry. And as the Bible says, he brings good news to the poor and sets the captives free. He is humble, brilliant, a visionary, and sensitive to the struggle of the overlooked and the downtrodden. He is doing and has been doing the work. He works for justice. He's an advocate for many. Dr. Haynes' strategic effort to stop predatory lending in many of our communities was so well done that he was able to change the zoning laws in Dallas and also the state of Texas. President Jimmy Carter was so impressed with his efforts, he called to encourage him and support him. He has done the work. On many occasions, former members that chose another um, church, of course, everyone has their right, but on many occasions, they have called on my husband to help them when they experience injustice and di discrimination. Penny would always say, well, did you ask your pastor to help you? And the response is typically, well, they don't do that. He has done and is doing the work. Dr. Haynes has done the work. He's a champion of HBCUs. If you've come to Friendship West for any amount of time, you're going to hear about the importance of black colleges and supporting our own. He has done and is doing the work. He is a scholar, of course, his undergraduate degree comes from his beloved Bishop College. And Freddie, it will never die because you do keep it alive, along with so many of your other college friends. <laughs> he is in the final stages of his PhD, which he will finish. He has done, and he is doing the work, but, but oh, can that Negro preach. I have a funny story I would like to share with you. Well, my dear mother, who's looking down from glory, would sometime hear other members, ministers preach, and they did not really exegete that scripture like she thought. She said, oh, I wish Freddie would re-preach -pre -re that scripture. Freddie, could you preach the scripture? He just didn't do it justice. <laughs> he has done and he is doing the work. He is an activist. He's a lover of the people. And he reminds us that Jesus is not just concerned about the individual, but also about the entire community. He provokes thought and stirs up our intellect and spirit. I just want to let you know, this is a visionary. He has done and he is doing the work. He didn't just show up. He's been here. He's been out front. He speaks truth to power. He is not scared. And 
he will continue to do the work. So I present to you the activist, the pastor of Friendship West Baptist Church. The lover of God's people, a preacher like none other, and now he has taken on the task of leading Rainbow Push Coalition because he has done and continues to do the work. I present to you Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III. Okay, if you can just stay on the stage for us off to the right, we want to make sure that we can get this oath taken care of. Please stand on your feet, folks. I want to go ahead and welcome Dr. Haynes to the Rainbow Push Coalition, but to officially do this, Michael Sorrell, the president of Paul Quinn College, and Reverend Siobhan Arline Bradley, president and CEO of the National Council of Negro Women and Rainbow Push Board Chairs, C.K. Hoffler and John Graves will administer the oath of office. Good evening, everyone. Tonight we're here to render the oath to a man who needs no introduction. I'm reminded tonight, as our duty is to call together leaders of tomorrow, Freddie Haynes is like the story of Samuel, a prophet who was given an assignment to name the next king of Israel. He was sent to Jesse, who had a house full of sons, who was spitting the mold of what they thought the king should be. And after seeing the seven sons in the house, the Bible says, the Lord has chosen none of them. Perplexed, Samuel knew what God had said, but couldn't see the evidence of it yet. And then Jesse announced, I have one more son in the field. I have one more son who is tending his flock. He is my youngest son. And Samuel said, well, call him in. And his name was David. But tonight his name is Freddie. The shepherd was in the field, and he called Freddie into the house. And God said, this is the one. Anoint him. And if I had time, I'd tell you that you could never let anyone speak to you about what God's plan is for your life. If I had time, I'd tell you that God's choice is always the right choice. But I can tell you this, that many have aesthetics, but not everyone is called for the assignment. If I had time, I'd tell you that many have attributes, but not everyone has the anointing. And in this season, someone from the field has now been called into the house. And tonight, my brother, know that you do not walk alone. We are the generation that has been tasked to reverse the hand of time. And as President Sorrell comes forward, we say to you tonight, your gifts have made room for you. As the college president speaking on a program with a number of ministers, I am the one they gave a script to. <laughs> Therefore, I will follow the instructions that I have been given. I would like to call my pastor to the stage. I would ask that the chairs of Rainbow Push and Citizenship Education Fund join him. And your wife and daughter have already joined you. Therefore, Rainbow Push Coalition is an international human and civil rights organization founded by Reverend Jesse L. Jackson, Sr. Rainbow Push has a rich history of challenging and transforming systems in the pursuit of liberty and justice for all. And it seeks to empower the vulnerable, through the effective use of grassroots advocacy, community mobilization, 
and issue education. Rainbow Push protects. Rainbow Push defends. Rainbow Push advances the cause of freedom, fights for economic opportunity, educational equity, environmental justice, and the enfranchisement and empowerment of the oppressed and the disheartened. Therefore, it gives us great honor and joy, Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III, to announce that you have been tapped by the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson Sr. himself, confirmed by the boards of Rainbow Push to serve as the second president of Rainbow Push. Will you please come forward? Pastor, do you promise to faithfully execute the office of the president of Rainbow Push? And will you endeavor, in the words of the prophet Micah, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God? It is then, with the power vested in me by Rainbow Push Coalition, that I say congratulations, Mr. President. May be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you. I believe it was Willie Mays who thankfully testified that every time he cashed his check, one of the first to make six figures as a baseball player playing for the San Francisco Giants, he said, I thanked my, I cashed my check but I thanked Jackie Robinson. In a word, Willie Mays was experiencing a Sankofa moment. Sankofa, from the Akan people in Ghana, West Africa, symbolized by a bird that was looking back in order to move forward. That bird had taken out of itself an egg, symbolizing its possibility, its future, its potential. And upon taking out the egg from within, that bird now could move forward, but it had to look back. Of course, this is the first day of Black History Month. And how appropriate on the first day of Black History Month that we look back we retrieve from within us an egg of possibility, but we look forward to a great future. Willie Mays said, thank you, Jackie Robinson, because had it not been for your sacrifice, had it not been for you opening up the door, I would not be doing what I am doing. For every Jackie Robinson, for every Willie Mays, we have to thank God for a Jackie Robinson. And so I stand here today to say thank you. First of all, I must say thank you to an amazing mother, a mother who has flanked me with her prayers while giving me life, and at the same time encouraging me every step of the way to be my best self, even when it went beyond the barriers or the bounds of what she perhaps expected. And so I thank you, Lynetta Haynes Oliver, for showing what it means to be a Delta diva with resilience, dignity, and class. I salute my wonderful mother. I thank God for gifting me with a phenomenal wife, Deborah P. Haynes. Deb is a wonder of a woman who, like Jesus, goes about doing good while being good to me and good for me. And so I thank her for her own work as she carves out her niche as a dynamic woman. 
a lovely sister, and again, a phenomenal mother and wife. I salute you, Deborah P. Taines. I'm grateful to have a daughter who is the goat of all daughters. She is as conscious as she is beautiful. She is absolutely smart and stunning. And she is also carving her own niche. I salute you for being the princess that you are. <laughs> Willie Mays thanked Jackie Robinson. I want to say thank you to the Jackie Robinsons who have blessed my life. So many of you are here tonight, and I say thank you. Thank you so much to my amazing, awesome Alpha Brothers. Thank you for being brothers I never had. Thank you for Epsilon Gamma, the outlaw chapter, doing what only you could do in pledging me a week underground and then the rest of the time that was legal. Thank you to all of the Divine Nine members for showing us what it means to use your privilege for those who are underprivileged. To use what God has gifted you with to open doors for others. You indeed embody what it means to be divine. And so I salute you and thank you. Willie Mays thanked Jackie Robinson. I've got to thank the amazing colleagues and comrades in clergy. My sisters and brothers in ministry who've come from all over this country. All of them are so anointed and gifted that they could literally have taken the podium this night and gifted us with revival. And yet they have shown something that for me is mind-blowing. They've shown up without even being on program. Most of them to say thank you. Most of them to say I'm here with you. And that means more to me than I have words to express. Thank you to my comrades in clergy. I love you. I praise God for you and for your wonderful witness from the sanctuary to the streets, as well as speaking truth to those in political and corporate suites. I thank you, my comrades in clergy. I salute those of you who are selected and elected officials. I salute you because most of you who are here are not transactional but transformational. And you recognize your responsibility is not just to occupy a white supremacist seat but instead to transform it for all of us in this country. I salute our elected and selected officials. I also pay homage to our business leaders who stand on business by handling business and when you handle business you recognize it's not about how rich you can get but it's about standing on business on behalf of those who perhaps have not had doors opened up for them I salute you I thank you Willie May said thank you Jackie Robinson I thank all of my Jackie Robinsons including the Jackie Robinsons who are civil rights activists and leaders many who are here this night and I I thank you because every single day without oftentimes receiving thanks you were fighting the good fight you were standing for those who cannot stand for themselves you are giving voice to those who have no voice Willie May said thank you Jackie Robinson you are my Jackie Robinson's I thank you I salute you I appreciatively applaud you also I must say thank you to our amazing board chairs John, John Graves and the amazing C.K. Hoffler as well as other board members of Rainbow Push thank you for your leadership and doing what you do behind the scenes as well as on the stage I have to take a personal moment now and say thank you to Jennifer Jones Austin the daughter 
of a phenomenal preacher prophet, William Augustus Jones Jr., who when Reverend Jackson shocked me and said, it's time for you to take over now as president and CEO of Rainbow Push. It was Jennifer Jones Austin, this justice conscious sister attorney who stood with me, walked me through the legalese of a transition, giving me what I did not have myself. I thank you, Jennifer Jones Austin, as Willie Mays thanked Jackie Robinson. Thank you for who you are and for all that you do. Willie Mays said every time I cashed a check, I had to thank Jackie Robinson. I also want to say thank you to Dr. Amos C. Brown, Sr. You got a little whiff tonight. That brother can go. He's a prophet without peer, true to his name, Amos, which means burden. He's carried a burden for justice, a burden for liberation, a burden for empowering those who were disenfranchised. I thank you, Dr. Amos C. Brown. Willie Mays said thank you to Jackie Robinson. I didn't get to know Jackie Robinson, but I know Jesse Jackson. <laughs> Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. touched my life early, long before he met me. I was a student at now defunct but never dead Bishop College here in Dallas, Texas. Reverend Jackson was the convocation speaker for our centennial celebration. I was mesmerized, captivated by his charisma, moved by his message, blown away by Reverend Jesse Jackson. I met him and then watched him run in 84 and 88. And you don't remember that, but please understand so much of what we enjoy now is rooted in what took place in 84 and 88. I guess you don't know it, so I'll help you. You don't have Barack Obama in 08 unless you have Jesse Jackson in 88. I've got receipts. Jesse Jackson in 84 ran and discovered that there was an unjust way that delegates were apportioned to the candidates because it was if you won the state you won all of the delegates Reverend Jackson said that's not democratic how dare you call yourself a democratic party and yet everyone does not have a voice and Reverend Jackson then in 88 transformed the way the delegates were apportioned and as a consequence of what he did in 88 if he had not done that in 88 then Hillary Clinton would have been elected in 08 but because Jesse Jackson stood up in 88 Barack Obama was elected the first African American president in the history of this country why because Jesse Jackson changed the policy Jesse Jackson and change the rules. Thank you, Reverend Jackson. I didn't get to know Jackie, but I know Jesse. And since I'm in this Sankofa moment, the least I can do is look back at what he did in 88 and now, and, and not only 88, but 84. And now in 24, it's time to change the rules. In 24, it's time to change public policy. In 24, it's time, Reverend Jackson, for us to go on the offense so thank you so much for what you did in 84 and 88 and we're going to get it straight in 24 because of what you did in 84 and in 88. I kind of sound like Jesse right there because y'all know that Jesse was rapping before hip hop was a thing. And so thank you, Jesse Jackson, for showing us the way. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being a prophet without peer. Thank you for being that prophetic colossus who strolled across the
limit, you did not limit your prophetic witness to Chicago and how we thank God for Chicago, but you took it from the south side of Chicago all the way to the Damascus Road and freed Robert Goodman. Thank you. I don't know Jackie, but I do know me some Jesse. Thank you that you dared to go to Iraq and free the captives there. Thank you that you dared to go to Armenia and free those who were prisoners there thank you that you had a you had a coattail so that even though you did not win the nomination we had black elected officials who got elected in 88 92 and 96 and beyond because of your coattails i don't know jackie but i know me some jesse and because i know me some jesse jackson i stand not in his shoes but on his shoulders and since i stand on his shoulders i hope you stand with me as we say we may not know jackie but we knew no jesse and jesse jackson you are a gift to us we thank you for doing justice Love Loving mercy, walking humbly with your God. Thank you, Jesse Jackson, for being Jesse Jackson. You were born in the slum, but the slum wasn't born in you. And indeed, you are somebody. And so, I didn't know Jackie, but I know Jesse. And since I know Jesse, in this Sankofa moment, I close by simply saying, thank you to all of you. Some have said, I can't wait to see what you're going to do. This ain't a me thing, it's a we thing. We've, we, we've had the gift of Harriet Sojourner. We've had the gift of Martin, Malcolm, and Jesse. But God did something unique with them. God used them to set the stage for us to do this together. And so I ask you to join with me. I hope tonight all of you will join Rainbow Push. It's on our website. You can do that tonight. Take out a membership in Rainbow Push. I want to thank Jeffrey Allen Johnson for his generous gift from Eastern Star Church. Go and do that likewise to each and every one of us. May we give generously to this work. Reverend Jackson says freedom ain't free. It costs. And here we are under the theme for such a time as this. Wow. For such a time as this. De La Soul rapped about the reality of the times in which we live. De La Soul puts it like this. The times is hard. And the stakes is high. With ungrammatical profundity, they understand the times. The times is, is hard. They're hard because we live in a country where right has become wrong and wrong has become right. And the politics of lying is, in a real sense, causing some to feel that what is li a lie is the truth. And what is the truth is a lie. These are some times where the times is hard. And the stakes is high. Stakes is so, so high that this year, this country will decide if we're going to go the way of neo-fascism or will we continue to strive to become a democracy. The stakes is high. And the times is hard for 140 million Americans who live beneath the poverty level. The times is hard and the stakes is high. And so we're called upon to do something, to stand, to look back so we can move forward. Dr. Brown was too gracious and humble to share what really happened, the full story. There in 1977, in his first year as pastor of Third Baptist Church, as he said, because the San Francisco Unified School District was not engaged in a culturally responsive education and was dissing African-American teachers and administrators. Dr. Brown led a boycott of the public school system there in San Francisco. We had a boycott. We, we literally, black kids didn't go to school for a day. Guess what we did? We got educated without going to school. 
because Dr. Brown organized the black church in San Francisco. And instead of going to Lincoln High School, we went to Third Baptist. We went to Providence. We went to Macedonia. We went to black churches that day. What's the point? The point is that the state of California funds school districts by the number of students who are in the seats. And so we decided to hit the district where it hurt in the pocketbook and y'all maybe that's what we need to do with our 1.3 trillion dollars as an economy in this nation every now and then we need to go back to what breadbasket did breadbasket said if we cannot work here we will not shop here if our products cannot be on your shelves we will not shop in this place we have the power to do it and so Dr. Brown led us in that boycott. We didn't go to school. We went to church and got educated. And then that night we gathered in a mass meeting at Providence Baptist Church. Dr. Brown had others speak. And then when he saw me walk in, he called me up. I was blessed to be a student of Homozell Davis, True Delta Diva. And Homozell Davis had just taught us we had read Roots, the book. We had read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Class was Afro-American literature. There's a scene in that book where Malcolm testifies. His father had been killed probably by the Klan. After his father was killed, his family was economically dismantled by the system. The system broke his family. And when the system broke his family, Malcolm every day would say to his mother, Mama, give me some food. I'm hungry. And she would say, we don't have anything. But he would relentlessly say, Mama, give me some food. I'm hungry. And she would say, we don't have anything. But he would not give up until finally she went to the back of the pantry, retrieved what little she had, gave it to Malcolm. And then she said, why can't you be quiet like your little brother? Malcolm looked at his brother who was quiet and hungry. He looked at the food in his hand and he testified, I discovered that day. If we're going to get what we want as a people, we can't be quiet. We got to make some noise. <laughs> Reverend Jackson, that night when Reverend Brown called me up, I told that story. As a 16-year-old, I said, we made some noise today. And that's what we've got to do in 2024. We got to make some noise. We got to make some noise until Jesse Jackson Jr. We bring about a constitutional amendment for voting rights protection because we cannot afford to have states like Texas and Alabama and Florida decide that they can gut voting rights and suppress the vote. We need to have a constitutional amendment. Thank you, Jesse Jackson Jr. We got to make some noise until every Every time someone has served their time in prison, when they exit prison, at that moment they ought to be engaged, they ought to receive their full rights as citizens of this country because they've already served their time. We got to make some noise and we're going to make some noise until we ensure, my sisters and brothers, not only that we have voting rights that are protected, but as Jesse Jackson Sr. said, that when someone turns eight, as a citizen of this country, they should automatically be registered to vote. We're going to make some noise until we have same day election registration of every voter in this country. We're going to make some noise until we have culturally responsive education for every child and we don't engage in what Jacob Carruthers called historicide because we know historicide leads to menticide and we are going to make some noise until we economically empower our black businesses so they will not find themselves on the receiving end of a racist like Edward Blum who is going after the fearless fund sisters who are simply trying to fund black and brown owned women business. We're going to make some noise until Roland Martin and all of our black media receives their fair share of the 
economic pie, y'all. It's time to make some noise. Our children deserve some noise makers. Our future deserves some noise makers. We gonna make some noise until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. We gonna make some noise until every single politician does justice, loves mercy, and walks humbly with our God. We gonna make some noise until every American has a living wage, not a minimum wage because that's too minor for us, but a living wage and a guaranteed income. We are going to make some noise until America is truly one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That means all, no matter where you live, no matter who you love, no matter what you look like, we gonna make some noise for all of God's children. It's time for us to make some noise. So if you're going to make some noise, let's do what they say in the culture and make some noise with our full chest. And if you make some noise with our full chest, victory is ours. I know it's ours because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. We're going to make some noise with our fearful chest because glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, glory hallelujah God's truth is marching on now go ahead with your full chest and let's make some noise the mic okay Pastor Haynes we got our mic going back here there we go give it up one more time for Reverend Dr. Freddie Haynes I want to go ahead and bring on Dr. Brown so that he can pray, be prayed over, I should say, by his pastor. Give it up one more time for Dr. Brown. I'm going to ask my colleagues to join me up here. I really would like this to be like an old school ordination. I need my colleagues to come up as Dr. Brown leads the prayer. Please, all of my colleagues, they've come from all over Bishop Swan, all the way from Massachusetts. Dr. Claybon Lee, thank you so much. Dr. Billy Curtis, thank you so much. Robert Kennedy, please, please, all of you. Joe Ratliff, please honor us, please. Thank you, Dr. Will Gaffney. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Charles Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Where's Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tish Dixon Williams. Thank you. I need to shout out my cousin who is here all the way from the D, Detroit. They represented in the uh, playoffs until they went to San Francisco. <laughs> Dr. Melvin Wade, uh, my uncle Emerson Lattimore, my uncle Douglas Haynes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Siobhan, thank you. Thank you for all of these amazing preachers. Charles, Charles Christian Adams, all the way from Detroit, the son of the great Charles G. Adams. Thank you. Thank you. Dante Hickman, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Melvin Von Wade, Bishop James Dixon, that prophet from Houston. Thank you. Thank you. Welton Pleasant. Thank you. Oh, Billy Curtis, thank you. Love you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia Doc, I didn't know you were here, man. Thank you. You got my text. Love you, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pastor Denny Davis. Siobhan, thank you. Thank you so much. Hank Davis, thank you. Joseph Parker, thank you. The Bishop of New Orleans, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm blessed, y'all. I'm blessed. I'm really blessed. Right before the prayer, I have to give, and forgive me for this, Friendship West Baptist Church is amazing. I love me some Friendship West. And they've let me stay for 40 years, over 40 years. It'll be 41 years next, this month. 
And so I want to thank you, Friendship West. Our leaders are here, deacons, trustees. I see y- y- y'all came out, my staff. I just love you all so much. And I want to thank you, Friendship West, because I get to do a whole lot because of you. And so I want to thank you so much for being Friendship West. Part of Friendship West is Reverend Jackson's favorite, Alicia Trusty. Alicia Trusty is my chief strategist. And Alicia, a few years ago, about two or three years ago, Alicia said to me, uh, you know, I'm too talented to just be doing secretarial work for you. Uh, I'm not working enough. I need to do a whole lot more work. And little did she know that Reverend Jackson was going to make it a whole lot more work. And so I want to thank you, Alicia, for your leadership, your mind, your gift, your blessing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Got to give a shout out to my sisters, Leona Bridges, who I grew up with in San Francisco. She's big baller in the Biden administration. And of course, my amazing sister, who has come to us from New York and is blessing my staff. Thank you so much, Marvela Hall. Love and appreciate you. Janice Mathis, Reverend Jackson, you see Janice Mathis? Janice Mathis is here. Janice Mathis did so much for Rainbow Push that I'm asking her to come back and do again. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's going to get me in trouble with my girl, Siobhan. But uh, I still need her. I, I really, can we, can we, we can talk. Okay. Because Janice Mathis is a gift. And we thank you so much, Janice. Love you so much. Dr. Brown is going to pray over me. And I'm going to ask my beloved son and who I'm well pleased, Dr. Marcus King, to close us in prayer for this night. Let us all pause for prayer. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from every blast, and our eternal home. We thank you for this mountaintop moment that has been laden with eloquence, empathy, encouragement, words of empowerment, and bottles of excellence. And we pray, God, that you would instill in every one of us that mighty army of peaceful warriors, of strategic fighters, and of souls with pit bulldog determination to not let any naysayer, any negative voice cause us to give up the struggle. So God, we pray as we extend our hands to this thy servant, thy beloved son, in whom you are well pleased to lead this movement. Grant him courage. Grant him the continuous exercise of wisdom. Grant unto him, O God, good health. Put a hedge around him. Protect his family. Deliver him from the evil one. For that evil one is lurking in this nation, in Dallas, and sometimes in our own communities. So, God, we pray that you would guide his feet, guide his tongue so that he may not run this race in vain. And when it's all over, and we've done our best, and he's led us ably with integrity, with great industry, 
and with great insight. May we all collectively hear your words of commendation. Well done. Well done. Thy good and faithful servants. You've been faithful of a few things. And now I make you ruler of minutes. This is our prayer we pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. As we remain in prayer, one more time, can we give it up for Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III? Please forgive me. Would you all thank God with me for a gift to our community, to Shara Parker? Um, she's one of the freest people you will ever meet. The sister is free, and she stands for us and represents us. And so to Shara Parker, thank you, thank you, thank you. My main man, Dr. Marcus D. King. Also, I think Snoop was saying there was a band playing right afterwards. Is that still? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so that right when we finish our Say Amen, there's a band for those who are able to hang. <laughs> All right. Let us bow. Dear Lord, as we prepare to depart from this place, but not your presence, give us in the words of one Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III, the passion not to just let us give you lip service when we leave and only give you hallelujahs, but engage in some do you lujahs. Dear Lord, as we transition and support Dr. Frederick Douglass Haynes III as he follows in the footsteps of the preeminent liberator and leader from Nazareth, Jesus, who is the Christ. Bless the drum major for justice, Dr. Haynes. Bless him to pick up the mantle of Reverend Jackson like Elisha picked it up from Elijah. Here we stand at the Jordan Bruton Theater in Dallas, Texas. As he does so, we call on the God of Elijah and Reverend Jackson and Dr. King and Medgar Evers and Fannie Lou Hamer and Rosa Parks and even his namesake, Frederick Douglass. As we join forces in justice when we leave this place and work to do, let us walk with him in, with rainbow push and push the agenda of justice. And P-U-S-H, pray until something happens. Plan until something happens. Partner until something happens. Protest until something happens. And then, God, let us praise you in advance and after it happens. Bless our minds to strategize. Bless our voices to be free from laryngitis. And God, boldly speak truth to power. Bless our feet to march like an army on a mission. Bless our hands to lift up the downtrodden, undeserved, un undeserved, undeserved and overlooked underestimated because God there is none like you and God in the words of the word of the Lord and now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever, it's about to go down like full flat tires. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> about to go down.